dogs either. We'll find that today. But there exist pathways that have such a level of control. The number of traits that are they're responsible for is upwards of two, three major complex things. And that does ruin that histogram. It's a complete jump that we had in those foxes. So a big way that pleopatry genes show up is development. If you have a gene that either speeds or slows development, and I don't mean like you're gonna come out undeveloped, what I mean is that if you stay in the puppy stage long enough, if you have the genes to determine that, you can change the phenotype and the behavior. And those of you in Zo, behavior is very much a phenotype and a trait. Now, this is a wolf puppy. They typically are quite amenable like this. Like I said, a lot of what we've done is harness on genes and artificial selections that delay this unpuppifying. When a lot of considerations, the genes that we're actually selecting on and their expression levels up and down, it is all to keep this window open as long as possible. I'll typically use this reference right here, what this is called and it's found in domestic species a lot, pedomorphism. You delay the onset of the adult phenotype. If you affect cells in development or genes in development enough, you can basically produce an organism that will never reach its final behavioral stage. So typically, like we said, a wolf will eventually get really angry and serious. It'll stop doing the play fighting with its friends. It'll get bigger, it knows it has to kill now, all that good stuff. Equally, these two aren't as important, but they are important for domestication itself. You have to slow overall development if you want to stay in that puppy stage. And to make a domesticated species, you need to have lots of, lots of offspring. Like we said, we had to cross off bears, for example. We had to cross off some other big ones like elephants because they don't have a good gestation time. It takes way too long. That's why as good as war elephants were, can't maintain them. They eat too much and they take too long to make more. Horses are a different story. So fun. Now to end the fox story, is it a dog? No, every species is different. Dogs are different, very unique. Wolves have more ingrained pack instincts than, and they're less, they're just less ornery basically and mischievous than foxes. Foxes are scavengers. They will open stuff, find stuff, and they will crack open everything. They'll pee everywhere. They have, they're really prone to anxiety without their moms. And thus, if you breed a domestic fox, it is extremely, extremely prone. So um, like I said, if you guys are on Instagram, follow, you can, you can check that, save a fox rescue. That's in Lakeville. That's the biggest one in the country. And she goes into a lot of really good stuff about what it's like, how they're not dogs. It's different. They are domesticated, but it's quite, it's quite unique. Okay. So why don't you see that variation in the wild? This is blue text, but it's simply that in the wild, coat color variations, behavioral variations, they have to be really slow. Imagine if you got a wolf out there that remained in that puppy stage social too nice. Uh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna survive that typical environment. Also, the reason we have so many coat color variations in domestic species is that once humans are protecting them, you don't need to camouflage anymore. You're done. That always brings up the fun question. Do we consider in the last uh, 150,000 years that Homo sapiens are better representation of the environment than the physical world or other organisms, right? So sort of ends our story a little bit. Some species have everything that they need to be something wildly different. That's kind of the point I want you to, this isn't on the test, but it's something that I do want you to see. In this really cool picture lives the heart of a Pomeranian somewhere deep buried inside in the genetics, epigenetics. Sadly, we can't do this one. It's yeah, like we talked about. Now, to key on something unique. Why was this so quick? Most dog breeds that you know today happened in the last 150 years when kennel clubs started being a thing. Rich people were like, I want that kind of weird dog. I want that one. Everything else used to have to have a purpose as a dog. It had to be a working dog. But you had a lot of shepherds, things like that. But everything came from the working breeds and then what we call village dogs. Who's ever seen village dogs running around somewhere, right? They're just, just kind of doing their own thing. That's the natural evolution. They're just going to follow us. Not necessarily as like, not necessarily as, uh, 
attached to us, but they still need our environment, kind of like raccoons. But you can take them and still artificially select the ones you want. That's where Pomeranians came from. Queen Victoria in Germany said, that little village dog, that nasty little thing, it looks cute, make more of it. And that's where we end up with. Typically it was a spitz that actually came from it, um, but still. The reason that we're able to act on this, like I said, how do we change so quickly? Do you remember jumping genes? Halo elements like you did in lab. Jumping genes move and break things and ruin promoters and dose genes up and down far easier than straight up mutations. This is always a funny one. So the one with pigs, porcine, endogenous virus, perv. Sorry, at least ours didn't end up like that. ALU is much nicer to say. But what transposons do is they will insert themselves like we showed and they can disturb genes themselves. They can delete growth promoters, make a dog small. Suddenly we seize on that dog and breed it, right? They can go into promoters and interfere with the transcription of glucocorticoid, right? Suddenly, if you got a transposon in the middle of your stress gene in the promoter, it's a lot less on all of a sudden, right? So epigenetic changes are often a consequence of these jumping around. Now, 70,000 years is a long time for dogs, but evolution-wise, it's nothing. It's a blip. So the key to fast selection is and always will be viruses jumping about. That's the way to really interfere quickly. Now, funny enough, who's ever seen Razorbacks, right? Who picked Arkansas to win some of the games in the tournament, right? Oops. Anyway, the Razorback is actually a feralized, re-feralized pig. It was brought over from Europe and it was domesticated at first, but it went back into the wild. Now their genome again has gone through wild pigs, domestic pigs, re-wild pigs. This is similar to what happened to dingoes. Their genome has no changes from a domesticated pig other than where its transposons exist. And those key changes allow it to survive in an environment that it never encountered before. Equally, Razorbacks are a pretty interesting story. The fact that they are one of the few species out there and as invasive as they somewhat can be, they survive humans. That is a very tall task for any mammal species to do. So the fact that they have that survival and that plasticity in their brain given to them by genetics that said instinct is out the window, you need to learn your environment, it's an interesting thing. So we take advantage of development windows to breed more attached breeds. Straight up wolf comes out as an adult. A lot of ancient breeds like Chow Chows, Shiba Inus, they have a lot of wolf in them. They don't necessarily enter that same puppy stage. They got a lot of adult wolf in them still. Now, as you keep going to labs, King Spaniels, and then hugs, you eventually slow down that development window so much that you notice a physical change here. But the development physically is mirroring now the development mentally. What happens to the pug's nose? Does it ever finish developing? Poor thing. I always take a straw poll because pugs are very polarizing. Who loves pugs? Who, who doesn't like pugs? Who thinks they're ugly? Oh no, <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> Poor things. So to, to, synom uh, to kind of summarize, remember this is Pedomorphus right here. This is our main one. This summarizes that term. Heterochronia is changing your development stage. So yes, is this genetic? Yeah, but it's not coding mutation genetic, again. So you can delay that onset. You can have your phenotype all without doing CRISPR all without really that much breeding, to be honest. Because we always had this argument about how artificial, artificial selection was so possible so quickly. Because Darwin even cites it in his book and he's like, hey, if we can breed traits out, it means like, you know, technically the environment can, right? The argument always was, how is it that fast? Mutation can't change that fast. The reasons I've given you are the main thing. So 
Again, big evidence here comes from the skull. Like you said, you see with the pug. Not, uh, not a lot of development going on there. Bulldog, I don't know what's, what's going on there. Poor Shih Tzu, too. That's just something different. But you see in a husky, which technically isn't an ancient breed, we just put wolves back into the stock for a while. They do mimic that same sort of adult development. So, always a fun story. We'll revisit it a little bit later, but the domestication event is theorized to happen, is to have happened at four moments in Homo sapien history. Three times in the Fertile Crescent and once in Europe when we arrived, or when Homo sapiens arrived from Africa. So, one last fun thing that I'll always leave you with. So, last uh, most common that we've got, chimpanzees and bonobos. You're looking at, at a bonobo female right here. It's a little jarring how young the offspring look and how they, they don't sort of have this development, right? So, the bottom here, that's the course of bonobo's skull development. as a human. We'll finish this another time. Take your first break. Okay, so this part of the class is one of my favorite, obviously, because you can see the things that we can change. Part of what I need to do though, is show you what is not possible to change or how certain tools are better suited for different jobs. I do wanna show you how medicine is gonna change, zoo, conservation, the whole thing. I will tell you again, like I always do, immunology is where most of this is headed. Imagine augmenting a human immune system to be immune to anything, right? It's not impossible. With biotech, first things first, proteins are what do stuff. They are what we need to affect. Whether we edit the DNA, we do something with RNA, or we actually hit the protein itself, that is what you need to change. Pictures you're seeing are antibodies, complements, receptors, enzymes, anchors, transporters, anything you could imagine. Every gene we've seen, 99% of them, they must be an amino acid protein. They must fold correctly into this unique shape. Any changes we make have to happen to this level to actually see the change. We've seen this once before as well. Proteins exist in this nice string of amino acids that we spit out from the ribosome during translation. Perfect. But chemistry, Ones that like to bind to each other will bind to each other. Others that don't like water will seek the core of the protein, for example. We know a few sequences that we can predict about protein's shape and that 3D shape that they will fold into. But it's very little, it's very tough to predict that because think of all the thousands, wait, what am I kidding? Trillions of interactions that are occurring between each amino acid set, right? As you spit out a sequence, how will it fold up? 
It has to be perfect too, right? And what you're after is tertiary structure, a complicated, you know, basically like model of whatever you want to go out and do something, whatever it needs to do, it has to be set up just to bind chemically to whatever its target is, anything. So everything we've got now has had the happiness to have been evolved over X number of years and whatever you're looking at. Everything that you see here is protein. You don't need to know every piece. I don't think I would, I feel like that's a cheap exam question to be like, what's not a function of protein? Or I feel like it would be cheap and or too easy. It would be too many things. But any changes to protein, that's where you get the issue. So yeah, you mutate DNA, but that's ultimately going to kill protein somehow. So models to make it easier to look at, array, kind of like we talked about here. Structure is what is going to determine that function, that 3D structure, that biochemistry, what is sticking out, what's positive, what's negative, what's hydrophobic on the inside, right? Everything. All those predictions have to go in somehow. In the case of an enzyme or something with a target, those folds and then those amino acids must create a perfect pocket to bind whatever they're after. Again, I'm going to speed through some of this blue text, but you can unfold a protein. It can go back to its natural just amino acid length. This can be accomplished through heat. This can be accomplished through damage. Sometimes other proteins are the ones that do this, though. But if you get to this point, you lose that function. You unwind that shape, you got nothing left. And this is only in blue text because the reason this is complicated is because there's a lot of chemistry flying around hitting itself right now. How the side chains are spit out is a huge determinant of how a 3D shape is going to show up. Biggest two things we can predict. Anything nonpolar does not like water. We know that the inside of proteins shield their water-hating amino acids in the inside. And the opposite is going to be true for any polar side chains. Polar means that it has a slight charge and it loves water. Those are going to be the ones all on the outside. So between alpha helices and basically what's going to be inside and outside, that's kind of where we're at. Okay, here's the problem. Proteins are spit out amino acid by amino acid. We do not know the pattern and how they fold. We don't know the chemistry behind it. It's too complicated. What this means is we also can't just create a protein. We cannot just de novo make something to accomplish a single goal. Typically, we borrow things that exist in nature. CRISPR exists in nature. HIV retrovirus exists in nature. We typically just take something, harness it, and use it again. The power to actually create something would be, that would be kind of the end game in biology if we could do that, we could make anything. Mathematically, it is not impossible that we can create any protein possible, protein that specifically targets malaria and kills it, let's say, protein that specifically augments your digestion system, makes you like waste a bunch of energy so you can eat whatever you want, for example, right? All right, two options, how this happens. One, biochem again and some physics, fun, right? Amino acids will be spit out and they will naturally just fold into substates gradually and gradually and gradually, whatever is the least or the best fit for their energy, right? So each stage, they will force the hydrophobic ones to the middle, put the polar ones on top, 
and it will keep charges like charges away from one another. This is a really cool way of saying that basically all this is saying is that the chemistry is going to dictate the folding. That's why I introduced you what denatured state is, because proteins as they come out and are born do not just pop out ready to go. You eventually have to get to that native state, and that's through a lot of chemistry and folding. Option number two, kind of like the initial slide. We basically just say that all the little substructures show up first. All these little helices that we know about, they start showing up, and then it's the helices that combine, you know, times 100 and the beta sheets on each other to eventually form a tertiary like final structure. So what I would say is that option one is much more chaotic. And there are steps that are far less predictable for us. Hierarchical is more just saying like, we know a few structures, they must be the ones that form first, then the thing, the rest of the stuff does. So I wanna introduce you to something. Who's ever heard of prions before? Nice. If you haven't heard of prions, have you ever heard of mad cow disease? Yeah. So, funny cartoon. Yeah, I don't know if you can read it. Hey, Morty, did you hear about that mad cow disease? Yes, good thing I'm a helicopter. Poor thing. So prions affect your brain. All a prion is, is a misfolded protein. It's one of your copper receptors in your brain. We don't really know what it's useful for, but whatever must be there for some reason. Unfortunately, if it takes on a misshapen fold, it suddenly creates an active site, a new active site. It's new zombie-like active site is a perfect fit for the old version of itself, and it will convert and crush this chemistry into a new prion. Think of it as a game of tag. Very sad one, though. Prions are not, you will use the word disease for the several types of prion diseases that exist. They are not, um, maybe something here. They're not exactly what you would call an organism. All right, let me just make sure someone was in there. Okay, because this is not a virus, this is not a parasite, this is not a bacteria, this isn't a fungi. This is one of your genes that misfolded that has a new corrupted function. immune system is helpless against this, and should you have a prion disease, you will die if it activates. There's nothing we can do. There are several different types of prion disease. Some actually are hereditary. There's, there's a version of this gene that is prone to going onto this shape. Others are a force of nature that we inflicted, like mad cow. So the mad cow disease goes that to save money, the pieces of the cow that nobody wanted to eat were ground up in a nice slurry and then fed to the cows. The acronym for that was called CAKE. Gross. In that cake existed prions. They were eaten by the mad cows that were the original ones in the UK. And they all would have this same phenotype of like walking in circles, putting their head just on the ground like this. Because what the prion does is eventually it folds so many of these that your entire brain just gets stuffed with them. Less room for water to go, no water, neurons die, whole thing goes down. So another one, chronic wasting disease. Anybody who hunts deer, for example, maybe you've probably heard of this. Chronic wasting is a prion that is in the deer population of North America. When you see a deer with this, you will notice that it's like, fur 
is very patched and messed up. Its head usually has a tilt and it's walking with a terrible gait, basically, kind of like a zombie. There's many state and national directives that when you shoot one of those, do not go near it. So chronic wasting is a prion. It just so happens to only activate in the deer because this prion happens to be from sheep that escaped a lab. Oops. It was actually Colorado State too, our bad. Now, it's pretty prevalent in the deer populations because all you gotta do is pass it on one prion is enough to infect an entire brain every time. I had a friend at UNO, that's what her research was. She would use it on hamsters and say, how few prions will it take to infect? One. Now, many of us have eaten venison, I imagine. It's likely that many people in this country carry this chronic wasting prion. Oops. Now, it's not active in humans. But as we've learned, there can always be events that change things, right? So for me, what I want, I want you to figure out what would be your top five solutions to a protein that is misfolding, specifically in the context of chronic wasting. You can approach this from a public, stand, from a public health standpoint or a scientific one, right? How would you stop this? So to add some urgency, let's say the reason for this, that we're doing this right now, is chronic wasting has started to environmentally trigger in humans. And like I said, there's no cure for a prion right now. You just die. Tell me from everything you know, how could we stop this from happening? So right now, all I want you to do is start thinking about that. Start writing down ideas, start writing down what you know about proteins, medicine, public health, anything you can. What measures would you take? Not all of them have to be genetic either, right? I gotta add some stuff, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. That's why I was kind of delayed this whole time as I noticed that this wasn't the updated file from, from earlier. My bad. Could have saved you guys some slides. Oops. Uh, suffer through learning. Don't worry. It's fine. It's fine to learn about prions. Okay, there we go. No, not really. Okay, so this is where you're headed if things don't work out. Normal brain is listed and shown kind of right here. Several prion diseases are list, shown alongside. Classic CJD, that is the prion disease that's hereditary. Uh, it's pretty rare. There's a book called The Family That Couldn't Sleep. It's a very good case study on how devastating this is. Kuru, that's a fun one. Uh, that's when humans cannibalize each other. Same thing with the cows, right? There's something about the death process that brings out the prion shape. Scrapey, that is chronic wasting disease. That's what came from sheep, jumped to deer, and we would really like to never have that jump to humans. And that's our little scenario right now. So here's what I want. I want your creative, I want your as best you can do some creativity as far as what the solutions could be here. Does it have to be genetic or biotech? Yeah, maybe not. Yep.
All right, who has about five? One thing I added to step three was not just cost, but feasibility. If any of you have solutions that require people to do something, be careful. Don't piss everybody off, I guess. All right, so you will have a chance to turn everything in and I'll be able to evaluate and share some creative ones because I do always actually enjoy doing this question in this class. Typically, somebody usually comes up with a extremely good idea, actually, because remember, the boundaries of science right now are more open than they've ever been. I'd say that much. We can do more than we can ever used to be able to do. One thing that I kind of didn't get to because it's still sort of in the works is that since last year's class, the whole protein folding problem as well, that's semi been solved by a lab in the UK at Oxford and who'd have guessed at Google. So they're gonna control everything, hooray. But if you have to pick one of the evil empires, I might go with them, I don't know, we'll see. So whoever's brave enough right now, if you are in a group, think of your best option. And if it is really good, now is the chance that you've always waited for to talk in front of 90 other people. Does anybody have a winning option? Because if I find an option that I think is the winner, yeah, this is worth two points, but let's say it could be worth more, right? Mm, how, much, how much would a, would a single point be worth enough to speak in class? Matt. Normal. One of my favorites. So idea number one has been claimed, create a prion that fights and kills the original prion. Neat, huh? That's, that's creativity, see? What else? What's a hardcore way to get this done? This is a disease that's gonna kill whoever it touches eventually, right? There's an added sense of urgency here, right? Abby. Right. Excellent. She's right. There are proteins that are responsible for assisting that folding mechanism that we talked about. Should we be able to modulate those well enough, which we can drug them as well, so all of a sudden, we're ranking things. If you can drug something that can affect a change, yeah, that's pretty good. 
Now, maybe it doesn't get rid of the prions that are floating around the person's brain immediately, but it does stop that flow from going as fast, right? That's a really good idea. Both, really good. Anybody else brave enough to shoot their shot? Yeah, so an enzyme that could not just refold the thing, but actually just degrade the whole thing somehow. Just erase it off the planet. It's not impossible. But again, both two solutions we've had so far do require making a new protein, which last year, not confirmed possible. This year, technically possible. Very cool. And would you rather take a quiz or have to speak in class? That'd be terrifying, right? Be okay. All right. Everybody else can hold their peace. Good job. You'll still turn those in and I'll still evaluate and maybe anonymously post my favorites. So this is also an exercise not only in sort of the limits of biotech, but also one of our top enemies. Like I said, prions are not something that we have the tools currently to treat, prevent, anything. Did anybody say just, you know, kill all the deer? And <laughs> yeah, see, I mean, like, open season, just to say the least, man, oof. Now, this also brings up another kind of good point. We are very lucky that COVID, and like COVID's to be respected, but it is not the same lethality level here. But we are very lucky that this pandemic was not bacterial and it could evolve, nor was it something like this. It would be very difficult to be on the same page, I think. That would be tough, even in, these, even in this light. So any public health option, you'd have to kind of acknowledge that that severity would be a little tougher. So I want to introduce you to a few characters to start. We've met a few of these. Three sets of how you do DNA. This is red text, by the way. I'm just showing you the whole thing. To kill DNA, you can use CRISPR or other knockout tech. To kill RNA of a gene, we've actually done that before. Remember the little micro RNAs? They go and bind the target and like near it and then like kind of crack it in half. Ah, oh, sorry. There does exist something capable of degrading proteins. So all of us in our, each of our cells, when you make a protein, it doesn't just exist forever, right? That's why a prion's a disease, right? There exists a biochemical molecule, protein itself called ubiquitin and a ubiquitinase. It is the trash compactor system of the cell. It adds these little chemical groups called ubiquitins, the C3 ligase does, to a protein that is destined for recycling. We are really close to harnessing this capability to kill proteins. What we're doing is introducing a organic chemical molecule called a protac that has three components that you're looking at right here. One, an area for its target to bind. Two, a chemical linker. And three, a link back to the ligase. Basically what you do is you kind of speed date whatever your target is to the ligase and it degrades it. We're taking a system that exists naturally to destroy what we want. Now, this sounds good and it does work quite a bit. We're getting much better at this chemistry, but it's very difficult. So for example, like what Dr. Bethel does is synthesize molecules. Molecules like this have this game-changing type of possibility, direct protein regulation. No messing with DNA, none like that. That is called a protac, a proteolysis chimeric targeting, or sorry, yeah, proteolysis chimeric targeting um, medicine. I can't remember. You don't need to know it for the test. <laughs> sorry. You just need to know protac. Now, I'm not one-upping anybody. Protacs are not 100%. That chemistry is not full yet. What is another disease that aggregates in the brain, though, progressively? Let's say not prion. Anything else, like think of that. Think about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, things that proteins just clog everything up. This is a way. It's something that we're thinking about. Right now, it's using cancer therapies. 
get rid of the gene, right? Instead of drugging a gene, just erase it. We're moving on right now. Hopefully that future opens up. But as you can imagine, any one of these stages is pretty dangerous though for the organism. Messing with a lot of, a lot of blueprints and a lot of good stuff here. Now, if it's life or death though, I'm probably gonna take that mechanism. So this is a much better detailed look at what a protest is gonna do for us. So ligase is always around. This is just in your cells. This is just, you know, you got to get rid of proteins all the time. Your cells use this. Hooray. What a protec does is just kind of does a union between whatever target you want and the ligase before its lifetime was supposed to end. And you just kind of get rid of it quicker. Now, here's something that I always want to mention protex and why controlling them is a little more difficult. When you send in a drug to inhibit a protein or even just take it out, right? One molecule of drug finds one protein and they both just go down, right? You can dose, right? Up and down. Protax don't get spent every time they kill off one of their targets. So one of the challenges we have right now is dosing because sending a certain amount of Protax into one mouse kills the tumor. Sending the same amount of protec into another mouse, it never shuts off and things go bad. Starts killing proteins that are close to its target, um, et cetera. So with strength usually comes weakness and vice versa. That's the key thing here is that not like a typical drug it does get recycled on its own every time. It's gonna keep ubiquitinating and that's going to send it to what we call proteasome, which is Latin fancy for just mess up this protein and grind it into bits. And what was once a functional issue gene is now dust. Well, amino acids, but you know. All right. Last character today will be CRISPR. Take a break. Enjoy the dog. Hooray. So a lot of what I'm going to show you today, it's, I don't want to leave you with the impression that anything is possible with CRISPR. It's, it's definitely something we're still very touchy with. Um, we're getting very, very good exponentially at it, but don't let, um, 
don't let the next two days think that it's like anything's possible. We can do anything. It's crazy, right? Um, there's some good videos in here in the links, so give those a shot when you want. But as much a caveat as I do want to provide, there's nothing better that we've ever come across than this. This allows us to change the whole thing, the whole equation, evolution, human, humanity, the whole thing. Okay. Obviously a story, but an important red text one, the worst kind. In bacterial chromosomes, the big, just squirrely blobs. So the story starts in prokaryotes. There were these sequences in the genome. They had these strange repeats of genes, of DNA. They were the same gene each time. And in between each of these same little repeats was a unique set of DNA each time. The DNA didn't make anything though. So for the longest time, again, remember in the old genome days, we didn't really have a good hold on what things were doing yet. We just knew it was there. But this always showed up in very unique sets of bacteria, a strange structure in the genome. With these little unique spacers, but then the same gene over and over behind them. So strangely, back in the 90s, commercial yogurt production, big business, you would never know, right? All their bacteria cultures kept getting hit by viruses, kept getting killed. Dang it. Commission was formed with a lot of money behind it. Find me why this is happening. But number two, zero in on the survivors. How did they survive the virus? The virus is comprehensive, and there was a lot of it in these tests. But you had something like 1% of these bacteria could survive and then make more of themselves. And those bacteria were taken. They, made, they became the favorite of the commercial producers, their stock, as you would call it. We still didn't really know why they survived. Equally, when you would sequence a non-exposed bacteria to a survivor, all of the survivors had a strange new set in their genomes. The repeats were there again, and there was an extra one this time. After exposure to a virus, the spacers would change. They would add a spacer. This unique, strange piece of DNA would just show up in the genome. So you'd put non-exposed genomes versus exposed, and suddenly you'd have this new, unique DNA. Now this time, they were armed with the, monies and the money and the tool to actually sequence their viruses too, and they would find that this sequence right here was from the virus, but it had been incorporated into the bacteria. These viruses were not like HIV, they don't integrate. So any integration that just happened must have come from the bacteria itself. So summarize, bacteria shows up, gets a hit by a virus. That virus sends in its DNA to try and infect. After this process, when the dust settles and the bacteria survived somehow, a sequence mimicking that of the original virus is now ingrained in the bacteria that survived. And it's next to all these other strange sequences. Clustered interspersed repeats, CRISPR. It is the bacteria's immune system. Just like you and I, we have an adaptive immune system. What that means is that when we see something, a pathogen we've never seen, those of you that got COVID, your body had never seen it before. It takes about three to seven days to truly get over it unless you, you know, didn't have symptoms. What you do is you take a piece of COVID and you make a copy of it, you send it to your immune cells and they start making and evolving a response in three to seven days. We never knew the bacteria had this memory the way we do. So start at the beginning. Nasty virus comes in, starts throwing its DNA in. A piece of this DNA during the initial battle is fragmented by some of the enzymes and it's caught 
that piece of DNA is then integrated into the bacterial genome. And it's next to genes that we had never really known the function for called CAS. CAS genes are the protein that makes CRISPR. We didn't know what it did before. But in this case with the red virus right here, oops, sorry, I should have color coded. In this case with the red virus, that sequence is then integrated into the genome next to the CAS genes. And what you'll find right here is that basically sort of added it to a collection, kind of like Thanos with the Infinity Stones, right? The red virus infected, but that piece of the virus that identifies it was taken into the genome and put next to the cast genes and separated by one of these black repeats right here. The repeats are always uniform. They're there to make space between the collection. Now, this gene right here, and that is kind of what you're looking at is a full on mega gene. It includes CAS and it includes the little spacers and the unique wanted posters of each virus. Here's the initial RNA right here. The spacers in black are uniform, but the little pieces of viral DNA, which are now RNA in this case, are present as well. These little pieces are then segmented into individual little segments to hunt for their target. In an event of an immune attack, the bacteria will hunt for all the viruses that it has ever been attacked by. That includes orange virus, green virus, and purple virus, as we have met right here. Those little pieces of RNA are used as honing signals. What they do is they combine in blue right here with what we call a Cas9 protein. That is the, the enzyme that makes CRISPR. It's the real thing. But it's uniform. It's the same gene over and over. But this gene can be loaded up with specific trackers. So in this case, after infection by the red virus, a piece of that red virus RNA will be loaded into a Cas9 protein. What this red virus Cas9 will do is find the attacking red virus and chop at that portion. The quote I have down at the bottom in red, the spacers, the one in colors, they act as wanted posters for the bacteria. So anytime it comes under attack, they're gonna make their entire array of things that have previously attacked them and say, go chop that thing up. What this means is that it can defeat infection as it happens. And here in the case of the orange and the green virus from its past, should those encounter it one more time, it remembers them and it kills them again. This is similar, but not the same mechanisms, obviously, that humans use for adaptive immunity. But combining protein in blue with unique RNA allows the bacteria to hone in on a specific piece of genetic material and kill it. Remember restriction enzymes where they cut at the right spot, but you can't ever change that spot. Here you can change the spot. Here's the real look. Main things to look at, two pieces that have to come together for Cas9 to work. In gray is the protein. That is CRISPR, Cas9 protein. That is what was in blue in our last slide. What it does, and it's, its active site as a protein is formed to fit around incoming viral DNA or RNA in some cases. It has room right here in these wines for RNA to come in. We call that a guide RNA. That is the wanting poster. That is the previous infection. What this will do is it will use that guide RNA to find the exact match of its target DNA in the natural world of virus. Equally, there needs to be a series of two Gs at the end of this guide RNA where it makes contact. 
we're not in biochem. I'm not going to have to get you too bad why, but I do want to prepare you with the outcome that, yeah, that's something I want on your note card. Things that you need for CRISPR, you need the cast protein, you need to guide RNA, it needs to match. You do need a little PAM sequence. It's basically like a good chemical fit at the edge of the protein there, basically. It needs to happen. Now, again, just like restriction enzymes. This is highly specific. It can change and it won't harm bacteria, right? Because the guide RNA is telling us where to kill. And that sequence is never going to be the bacterial pr protein or sorry, genome itself. It's going to be the virus. If you're worried that they might look alike, do the math on how many combinations exist of 12 nucleotides for each, right? Okay. This is a system that hunts and kills. Now, this was the way that it sort of just stayed for a long time. And for a long time, we didn't have this revolution yet. We didn't know that we could program where to cut and what to do. And equally, we found a new step as well. I don't know if it's down here as much. We found that if we could introduce guide RNA to cut at a certain spot, but then also feed a new piece of DNA, the cell wouldn't know whether to repair the old version or the new version. And we could introduce something new in the genome. So why this is a big deal? It's cheap, number one. We will be doing it today, some of us. Number two, it's insanely accurate. It doesn't take very long. Designing it's the hardest part. Actually doing it in the lab is probably one of the easier parts. So just like print, just like a car, it is a extreme jump in what we're capable of. Equally with that, and we did this in the beginning of the class, What's the more powerful force, the bite, the gene, or the atom? This makes, a, this makes a hard argument for the gene, suddenly. It was a story worth telling. Jennifer Doudna, out in UC Berkeley, goes to lunch with one of her friends who's a microbiologist. Microbiologist knows about CRISPR, has for the last decade. Tells her, yeah, the bacteria can actually like decide where they actually want to clip DNA. She says that she just kind of spit up her coffee and was like, I got to go. Looked up every paper she knew about it. Worked with Dr. Charpentier in France, made the first edits that were directed. Now, this is what's called getting scooped. Technically, Feng Zhang at Harvard saw their results one way or another. He immediately does it in a mammal cell and it works. So right now there's actually a patent war going on of CRISPR, which is also kind of strange because technically it's kind of a law of nature, right? That's also being argued. The, U, the EU recognizes Charpentier and Doudna as the patent holders. The US recognizes Feng Zhang as the patent holder right now. But things are a little unique right now with CRISPR. It's not a living organism, yet it's pulled. In each of these little stages, these timelines, you'll see the jump that happened once we saw, oh my God, we can decide where to cut. We can decide what to do. We actually had genome editing ways before. But man, they were not easy to use. So for example, like during my PhD, we did a CRISPR experiment. It was kind of, it was kind of hard to find which ones worked, whatever, but it was finished in half a year. I had a friend, his PhD lasted seven and a half years because he used a system, an old system called Talons, very hard to work to manage system and uh, cost some time there. That's why this is so much bigger. So the big thing we're showing this too is that where we're at right now is due to a lot of people. Doudna probably deserves the most credit. That's why she's up there first. She's the one that wrote the book. She's definitely the more approachable one. Let's just say that Feng Zhang's not the nicest dude on the planet. This is a bit of a modern Watson and Crick type of thing, but like it's not as good as even Watson and Crick did better than him, I'd say. All right. Two options for CRISPR. We can tell this where to knock out a gene. 
make a clip right at that moment, kill the gene, right? Easy. That's the easy way. So option one, you just go in here, cut that with CRISPR, and look at our old repair mechanism that sucks. Make a double strand break, right? Non-homolics end joining, it's gonna make mistakes and the gene's probably gonna die. See that red stuff in there, right? No good. So we've always had stuff that could knock stuff out though pretty easily. Um, this makes it way easier than before, but it wasn't the revolution that the one on the right is. On the right, homology directed repair. This is like, this is kind of like the second tier thing. Remember the gene conversion? We are faking that here. So instead of cutting and then just running away, we cut, but you have to give something back. You give a piece of DNA that you would like incorporated instead. And a lot of the time, the cell will take the new DNA and ignore the old DNA. It's very much like the movie, The Prestige. Who's seen that? It's pretty good. Oh my God, I'm old. All right. Anyway, any, any magician's trick, just because you can take something away, you've always got to bring it back. And that's the, that's the beauty of CRISPR is that it's not just knockout. It's not just killing. It's changing. You can change how a gene looks, how it functions, everything. And you can do it really easily. So what we're doing in lab, one of the options, and it will be a responsibility to read, go through the protocol and figure everything out. That's kind of how we're, you know, this is kind of your deep end pool moment type of thing. Saying as somebody who can't swim, it's terrifying, but still. I'm fine. My, my parents think I can't swim, so they're kind of, they've convinced me at this point that I'm in danger. <laughs> Sorry. I can, I can dog paddle, I'm fine. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> so this is just a little overview right here. Think of the key ingredients you need. That is an easy exam question. Oh no, what's not something you need for CRISPR, right? You better have Cas9 protein. You better have a guide RNA. You better have a target sequence that matches. Other fun thing, and this is our first caveat. Do there exist portions of the genome that look very much alike across 12 nucleotides? Yeah. It's gonna have some off-target hits. This isn't perfect. But essentially, this system is fairly uniform, recognizes mammal DNA just as easily as prokaryotes. I'm not saying it's going to work every time, especially in labs, so be careful, take your time. But the union of an RNA and a protein to guide to the specific spot we want, because we have no problem designing RNA and feeding it to the protein. That's part of what we're doing today, or sorry, in lab this week. We'll be set up with two plasmids. One of the plasmids has Cas9, great, no guide, just floats. The other plasmid does come complete. It's got Cas9 and it's got the guide. You will expect in that one, depending on the scenario with the other plates, it has all the tools. Okay. This is another thing. As much as people would like to patent and freak out over this, is extremely easy to get your hands on. I will say though, it is, there were, there were definitely certain difficulties. Um, when you buy the Cas9 gene as a plasmid, you do have to sign a contract and you have to get the lawyers out from MSU or Gustavus when I was there and say, you will not, under threat of crimes against humanity, use this on a human cell or an embryo. Not a human cell, but an embryo. So the UN does have a moratorium on this right now. That's what makes the, the twins from China. Suppose, I, I think there's proper digging still to be done on that, but that what makes them a little unique and different. They were born without that choice to have that site edited and all the off-target sites that may have come with it, right? We don't know what's gonna happen there. Now on the lighter side of things, Hooray, we can ma manipulate our yeast. They'll make beer that doesn't make you hungover. Hooray. It's kind of funny, right? Imagine how much money you could make from that, right? Ugh. Maybe that's how we can break bad. But more importantly, 
This was not possible two years ago. Sickle cell, severe sickle cell, two alleles, all curve shapes, right? That's not a good phenotype. But we can change that now. Send in a virus packaged up with the CRISPR components, the guide RNA to fix the sickle cell gene, exchange one nucleotide for the other. And suddenly, patients like David, their condition comes back. They don't have the same symptoms anymore because some of their cells suddenly start making the hemoglobin half right. And suddenly they're like a heterozygote and immune to malaria, but still healthy enough. So what was fate once, that is definitely on the table for us now. And I swear, remember, I've done CRISPR for a few years now. This slide was only last year that this trial is working. And it means something. For me, I mean, I don't know. It was something that you kind of, you know, as you grow up, you kind of expect not to see things. You always have kind of a thing like, well, I won't live to see that cool thing. This is one of those times right now. So we'll get to do a lot more on this. But I want to leave you with this last slide. These are the things I need for CRISPR to work. Keep that in mind for whenever you are studying. I will try and obviously pepper you with some practices, but this is one of those outcomes that's a little more concrete for me. Certain things you need to have around. Oh no, and I'm cruel. I don't think this is in the key info, sorry. God forbid you come to class. I'm kidding, don't worry. Okay, you guys are good.